Welcome to Fairview Baptist Church in Lindsay. Not only do we want to minister to the people who regularly attend Fairview, but we also want to minister to those who live within the city of Kortha Lakes with the good news of Jesus Christ. Come on in and, and join us for worship. It is our prayer that you'll be blessed. I believe uh, I'm, I'm about to speak something of, of your word. But Lord, if that's not the case, if, if I say something in this sermon that is not of you, I pray that it would just be forgotten and, 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 and just not heard. But Lord, if, if what I, I say does come from your word and, and is of you, I pray that it would plant itself in the hearts of those who are hearing it so that it makes a real change in our lives. I ask this because of your son. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Okay. You know, there, uh, there are quite a few things that uh, you and I, we could, we could be upset about uh, in this world. Really, there are. Uh, worthy things. A few weeks ago, Pastor John taught us uh, on anger, and there is a time and a place to be angry. Uh, we've learned that. But you know what I've found? i found over all of the things that I ought to be upset about and ought to anger me, I find I'm, I'm upset about very few of them. You know what gets me upset from a day-to-day -day basis? Here's, here's what gets me upset. Slow walkers who are in front of me, I just want them, get out of the way, like you're slowing me up. Spotty Wi-Fi. Okay, spotty Wi-Fi, there's a big, like, oh boy, these first world problems that I have, right? You know, calling up customer service and getting put on hold, that's, that's the worst. Like, all these things. We just got an update from Haiti, man. I got, I got almost no problems, right? There are all these things that, uh, that I get upset about. You know what? You know what happens? I let these things fester in my heart. And uh, it's, it's not that I get angry at traffic anymore. I just am angry at traffic. It's just a part of my personality. It's just, it's just a part of who I am now. I just, that's who I am. I'm angry at traffic. It's this long-standing bitterness that I have. I think as a, individually, I can speak for myself, but as a society, as a culture, our anger is completely out of whack. It is. We get upset over small, seemingly insignificant things, but there are huge things, huge injustices in this world, and we, can, we hardly feel anything for those things. And I, we, I mean, it's, it's hard to feel anything for these things. There have been so many of them. It's, we're exhausted by all these disasters and tragedies and, and injustices that happen in this world. There are so many of these that have happened in the past couple of years. I don't even remember half of them. And neither do you. Right? We, got the, we had the earthquake in Haiti. We had the earthquake in Japan. Now we got another earthquake in Haiti. We got a hurricane out in uh, uh, Hurricane Matthews, and we had Hurricane Katrina. We had Al-Qaeda, and we've got ISIS, and we've got uh, Nice, and, and Paris, and the Ukraine crisis, and the Syrian crisis, and, and, the, and the abduction in Nigeria, and Fort McMurray. Like, I can't even remember half of these. And if any one of these were to happen to me personally, my life would be changed forever. But I see dozens of them on the TV, and nothing seems to ever change. But, but instead of, of getting upset for these worthy things, you know what I get upset? I get upset and angry about these petty, selfish, individual things. Am I the only one? I want us to rein in, I want us to learn from the word how we can rein in our, our malice, our anger, our bitterness, how we can rein that in. So I want you to turn uh, in your Bibles to Ephesians 4, verse 31 and 32. We are continuing our series called The Great Exchange, and we are learning in this series how we can put off the old self that was characterized by sin and, and, and death and destruction and all this bad stuff, and we're continually putting on the new self characterized by Christ and his Holy Spirit. And today, we're going to learn to put off malice and put on something much, much greater. But malice is a, is a pretty broad term, so I want us to actually discuss what malice means. Uh, let's look at uh, verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 31. This is what it says. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. So here are a, a bunch of examples of malice. There are more, but here are a few. Uh, bitterness, which is this long-standing anger towards someone. Well, what happened? 
the thing clicked away on me. I have no idea how that happened. We are not there yet. Okay, we're not there yet. Okay, uh, bitterness, back on track here. Bitterness, uh, which is this long-standing anger uh, with someone uh, that doesn't seek reconciliation. There's anger and rage, which are these uncontrolled emotions, and there is a, a slander and, and brawling, which are these uncontrolled actions resulting from those emotions. And these are all malice. These are all, these are all malice. And, and this, this passage is going to tell us to put that off and put on something much better. But I don't want us to stop there. I don't want us to leave today thinking, man, I'm going to try really hard to not be bitter this week. I'm going to try really hard not to be angry or malicious anymore. I'm just not going to do it. I don't want us to stop there. What I want is for us to gain a, a shift in our perspective on obedience. Now, obedience is such an, it's almost an ugly word. I don't want to learn obedience. I just, oh, it's terrible. I don't want, I don't want that, right? Like, oh, obedience. But I think if we look biblically at what obedience means for you and for me, I think we're going to unlock the joy, the joy, yeah, joy, of following Christ. I want there to be a great exchange in our thinking from, from obeying God moralistically because we have to, because it's a duty that we have to do. And I want us to exchange that with worship, with obedience that is joy-filled, life-fulfilling, Christ-exalting worship. You want to get there? I want, I want to get there. Okay, so we'll, stay with me. Track with me, okay? Let's get there. Uh, first, I want to talk about uh, malice, and, and we'll get there. Uh, why do we feel malice? Why do we get malice in our lives sometimes? Why am I bitter about something that's small and personal to me, but I don't feel angry or upset over the big injustices that happen in the world? Well, here's why. This is the biblical reason. Here's why. We'll get to the scripture passage in a bit, but malice is a compass for desire. Here's what I mean by that. Whatever it is that you're angry about, whatever it is that you're upset about, it is always related, every single time, it will always be related to something that you desire, something that you love, something that you want. This makes perfect sense, right? If you're, let's say you're a parent, and you've got kids playing out in the front yard, and someone zips by, going 100 kilometers an hour past your front yard. You get really upset about that, right? You get pretty mad. Why? Because you love your kids. You want their safety. If a friend of yours got robbed, you'd be really upset. You'd, you'd, you'd be angry. Why? Because you want what's best for your friend. Think about it. Like Over the last week or month or whatever, whenever you felt angry or upset, every single time it is related to something that you desire, something that you love. And so when we are angry, it shows us our priorities. It shows us what we love most. It shows us what we desire. And in that way, malice is a compass for desire. I know this is true for me. Okay, I was, I was wondering whether or not I was going to tell this story. I'm going to tell this story, okay? Um, it's a pretty silly story, but there have only been two times in my life. This is a humble brag. There's only been two times in my life where I've been full-on enraged, like really mad, like really mad. And here's one of the times. I was in my dorm room uh, when I was at York University. I was in my dorm. A bunch of my uh, roommates were around, and I don't know why, but I had my phone out, and I was taking a picture of something. And one of my roommates had uh, a water bottle. Have I ever told you guys this story at youth? No, oh, good, good, yeah. <laughs> and one of, one of the roommates uh, had a water bottle, and he was just flicking water at me. It was just really annoying. He was just flicking this water bottle at me, and I was getting wet. And you've got to understand, this guy, this roommate of mine, he, he was a guy who, who uh, uh, went to the dojo every week and learned jujitsu, and he would always perform moves on me, and he's like, this won't, won't hurt. And then I'll end up waking up in the hospital like a week later, right? Like, so this is the kind of guy. And I don't know, I might have gotten up on the wrong side of the bed that morning, or he was being really annoying, I don't know. But I was losing it. I was getting really mad. He was flicking his water on me. And then he took the whole water bottle and dumped it right on me, okay? Right? And so I, I'm, I lose it. Okay, and I chase this guy down, and I corner him in the entranceway of the dorm. And I, this doesn't seem like me at all, but this is, this is what happens. I corner him, and this is what I do. I fake with my left, I cut with my right, and I get him right in the rib cage. Okay, I smoke him right in the rib cage, and he collapses on the ground. And I, right away, I was like, oh no, like I was so, I got right next to him, and I was like, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I don't know what came over me, right? 
And like he he has a like a, a, a rough spot on his rib ever since I cracked his rib, but like there was a big black bruise. It was crazy. Oh, I, I'm like and look, looking at, at the time, I was like, what came over me? I just smoked this guy in the rib. But now looking back, I know exactly why I did it. I know exactly why I did it. I did it because he was threatening something I loved. And what I loved is to be respected. What I love is to be held in high esteem by other people. What I love is my reputation. And so when this guy comes around and starts threatening me, uh, threatening it with this water bottle, and people are around to see it, I lost it. This malice came up in my life. Malice is a compass for desire. Here's a good question to ask yourself. Oh, I, I missed this whole part. Oh. This is where this comes from the Bible, by the way. <laughs> we need to make sure we get this part down. All right, this is how it comes from the Bible. Look at this. Okay, James is writing, writing to the church. I'm, I'm a mess this morning. J James is a write, writing uh, a letter to the church. And, uh, he, and there's all sorts of malice going on in this church. They're getting in fights. They're getting in quarrels. And James wants to explain to them why this is happening. This is what he says. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires, that battle within you? You desire, but you, you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. So that's straight from James. The reason why you're having malice, the reason why you're having fights in your church is because of the desires of your heart. By the way, those desires are not very pure. Most of the times, the things that come out of our malice, we're not learning how much we love our kids. We're learning how much we love ourselves. So here's a good question to ask ourselves. What does your malice tell you about you? What is it that you're getting angry about? What does that say about what you love most, what you desire most, what you covet the most? What, what does it say? Think about it. Maybe you, maybe you love money. And you love money so much that you get in fights at home at the expense of your, of your marriage. Or, or maybe you love to be right so much that every time someone has a different opinion other than yours, you get in a fight over it, you get bitter about it, and you get angry at it. I don't know. What is it? This is a good question to ask a close friend or a spouse. And here's the thing. If you ask this to that person, be prepared to believe their answer. Because this is often something we can't see in ourselves. Other people can see it. We can't see it in ourselves. So be prepared to believe them if you ask them. So you might be thinking, okay, all right, if you're right, and I believe I showed you the scripture on it, right? If you're right and malice is a compass for desire, then I know personally I know that my priorities are way out of whack. Like, I'm loving things that I should not be loving so much. What should I do? Well, we're going to go to the scripture for that. Take a look at what uh, the passage says here. Chapter 4, verse 31. Let's go back there. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Verse 32. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. So this is what we need to do. We need to exchange malice with a bent toward forgiveness. We need to put off that malice, that anger, that bitterness, that rage, that slander. Put that off and put on kindness, compassion, and forgiveness. That's what we need to do. And Jesus illustrates this very thing in, in, in a very well-known parable, the parable of the unforgiving servant. And uh, Peter uh, goes to Jesus. Like Jesus teaches this parable after Peter asks Jesus a question. Here's the question. Peter goes to Jesus and says, Jesus, how many times should I forgive someone who's wronged me? Seven times? And Peter's probably thinking, man, seven times, that's a lot of times. If someone wrongs me more than seven times, I, I'm sorry, I'm not. Eighth time, I'm not forgiven. That's it. That's it. I'm done after that. But this is what Jesus says. He says, not seven times, but 77 times. In other words, Peter, don't bother keeping track. As many times as you're wronged, you forgive. Now, I'm reading this. I'm reading this, right? I've got my Bible. I'm reading this. And I'm thinking, Jesus, how, how can you expect me to follow that? You know how much this person's wronged me. You know the money that they've cost me in the, like, in the thousands of dollars. You know. You know the hurt that that person has put in, in my life. You know the scar that that person left on my life. How am I supposed to forgive this person? They don't even want forgiveness. They're not sorry. 
How am I supposed to forgive this person? Seven times? Even seven times. Well, Jesus answers that question with, with a parable. So here it is. I'm, I'm going I'm I'm to share the parable with you. It's, it's this parable of this man who owes 10,000 talents to a king. 10,000 talents is a lot of money. If you were to translate that into our money today, it would be over uh, around a billion dollars. A billion with a B. Billion. And that's a huge amount of money. We can't even really understand how much money that is, so I want to kind of illustrate it for you. If you had a pile of $100 bills and you stacked them on top of each other, how high do you think that stack would have to be in order to be a billion dollars? This high? Way higher. Over a kilometer high. That's a billion dollars. And that's $100 bills. Over a kilometer high. That's a huge amount of money. And this guy owes that much money to the king. And one day, the king calls in his debts. He says, hey, you got to pay. And he goes to the king and he says, I can't pay. And I don't want to sell my family into slavery to pay for this debt. So, so please, forgive the debt. Just have mercy on me. And the king does. He, he forgives the debt. He's a good king. He's a merciful king. He forgives that debt. That's part one of the story. Here's part two. The servant goes home, and someone actually owes him money. Someone owes him a hundred denarii. Okay, and, and today, in today's money, a hundred denarii is around $10,000. It's a good chunk of change. Nothing to laugh at, okay? That's a good amount of money. It's not quite a billion dollars, though. If you were to have a stack of $100 bills that equal $10,000, you know how big that stack would be? Around four centimeters. Now, just to see how small that is compared to the big stack, I'm going to just put this stack right next to the billion dollar stack right here. I'm just going to place it right down, right here. There we go. It's not very much, is it? And this person owed him $10,000. And so he calls in his debts, and he says, you have to pay me now. And this one person couldn't pay him. And so this servant actually throws him in jail because he can't pay him the money into debtor's prison. The king who forgave his debt, he finds out about this. He learns that that servant did that, and he calls him back, and he says, you know what? Because I forgave your debt, and you couldn't forgive that person who owed you money, you're going to have the same fate as him. And that person ended up in jail. Now, Here's the striking thing that Jesus says at the end of this parable. Here's what he says. This is important. He says, this is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive from your heart. Here's a few things we learn from this parable. And the first, the first one is, forgiveness is not optional. Do you know that? It's not optional. It's not something you can decide not to do. You just... We don't have that right anymore. Because Christ has come, and because he has forgiven our billion-dollar sin debt, each of which, each of which of those, earns us an eternity away from Christ. He's overcome that insurmountable debt. And because he's done that, we no longer have the right to withhold forgiveness from those who wrong us. He stamped us and bought us with his blood. We no longer have the right to withhold forgiveness. It's kind of like this, if, if, if you owned a small business and that small bu- people owed that small business money and that small business got bought out by a big business, who would those people owe that money to now? Not you. I'm no businessman, but not you. They would owe the big business. In the same way, we've been bought out by Christ. He, he's bought us. We're his children. We're bought out. So people are no longer accountable to me when they wrong me. They are accountable to who? This is incredible, incredible teaching. And here are a few just little tiny statements just to, just to hammer this home a little bit. Um, here's, here's a little pithy statement. How forgiving you are is a reflection of how forgiven you are. That's true. If you really can't bring yourself to forgive someone who's wronged you, if you really just can't do that, this is what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches, well, you can read it for yourself. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Next one, Mark 11, 25. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your heavenly Father 
uh, so that your heaven, uh, Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. It's clear as day. Forgiveness isn't optional for us. It's just not. And here's another thing. If you have felt the freedom and the release of knowing your billion-dollar sin debt was taken care of, if you felt that, there, I know it's tough, but you actually feel some kind of joy from giving that same kind of grace to those who have wronged you. I know it's tough, but it's there. You just love to come to reconciliation with people and love to forgive people. And if that's something that you've never felt, maybe, maybe you've never felt the forgiveness that Christ has bestowed upon the people who trust in him. This is such an important thing. We need to forgive our, uh, people who have wronged us despite the great, things, uh, the great harms that they've had against us. Here's another little pithy statement. We can develop a, a bent towards forgiveness if we believe you can't be wronged as greatly as you've been forgiven. That's true. You cannot be wronged as greatly as you've been pardoned. Now, here's what I'm not saying. I am not saying that the wrongs against you are small. Because they're not, in many cases. People, have, people in here have been seriously, seriously hurt. They've been seriously wronged, and it's real. And they've got scars, and it's tough for them, and it, and it will be tough for them. And, and it's cost them tens of thousands of dollars. I, I don't know. Or, or it's cost them hurt and harm for decades. I'm not saying those hurts aren't real. But I, what I am saying is that those hurts will shackle and prison you if you do not see them in the light of all that Christ has done for you. They'll shackle you. They'll keep you down. They'll keep hurting if you do not see them from the perspective of all that Christ has done for you. You know, if you go through the Rocky Mountains and you're traveling through there and, and you look at those mountains, they look insurmountable. They're huge. They're enormous. There's no way you could, you could uh, climb these things. They're too big. But if you were to fly over those mountains, they wouldn't look so big anymore, would they? And you know what? If you look at the Rocky Mountains from space... The earth is just flat and round. In the same way, if we allow ourselves to see what Christ has done for us, to see that he has forgiven our billion-dollar debt, we can see that those wrongs that are against us, yeah, they're big, but not in the light of what Christ has done for us. We know we can't be wronged as greatly as we've been forgiven. <laughs> Here's something that's helped me. So that's pretty funny. <laughs> Here's something that's helped me so much with developing this bent towards forgiveness. This is so, this is so cool. Get this. We, we should learn how to forgive someone before we're over it. I say this to the youth all the time. We need to learn to forgive people for, before we're over it. Because we, we often wait until we're over it, and then we forgive. It's the, kind of the last thing we do. Let's not do that anymore. Forgiveness needs to be the first thing that we do. In, in a conflict, okay? It needs to be the first. Uh, we need to be able to say to people, hey, look, you wronged me. It, it was wrong, and it hurt, and, and it's terrible. You hurt me. But I, but I forgive you. Why? Because you're not accountable to me, first. And secondly, I need forgiveness myself. Now, if we can do that, if we can forgive first, this is what's going to happen. I can't promise this, but this is, what's, this is what I bet will happen. First, you're going to get over that hurt a lot faster because you've already released that, you've forgiven that person. And secondly, that other person who, who wronged you, they're going to want to make amends a lot sooner too. So let's do that. Let's, let's forgive before we're over it. And this has happened to me countless times. You want to forgive someone, you eventually urge up the, you know, the courage to do it, and you go do it, and the other person says, oh, thank you for bringing it up. You know, th I'm... I was thinking about this, and that's just been on my chest, and I just thank you for, for saying that. I, I'm so, so sorry. And it's such a relief when that happens, right? Let's swallow our pride. Let's swallow our stubbornness and forgive people who've wronged us. Here's the, here's the best thing about forgiveness. I'm excited about, about this part. This is so good. I love this, okay? 
This is so freeing and so biblical. This is the great thing about forgiveness. Check this out. Okay. Everything you think you'll accomplish with malice, with being angry, with being bitter and stuff, everything you think you'll accomplish that way, you'll actually accomplish with forgiveness. Seems too good to be true, right? But it is. God's word is too good to be true. I love this. Okay, here's a few examples. Okay. Let's say someone's spreading rumors about you, and you want those rumors to go away. Like your end goal is for those rumors to go away. You don't want those rumors. So what, you do, what do you do? You get angry at anyone who says those rumors. You get mad, right? You say, don't say that anymore. It's awful, right? That actually won't work. Check, check this proverb out. I love this. The vexation of a fool is known at once, but the prudent ignores an insult. You know, when you're getting mad at people who are saying awful, rotten things about you, you're actually letting your vexation known. You're actually giving legitimacy to the pe- things that people are saying. You're actually helping them do what they're doing. But if you ignore it with a bent towards forgiveness, with a bent towards kindness and compassion, that's going to combat those rumors a lot better. Here's another example. Let's say you're a boss, right? You're, 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 you have some employees, and you want to gain respect. You want them to respect you. So every time something goes wrong, you get angry. You get mad. You make sure that they know who the boss is so that you get all the authority. That's the end goal, to have authority. Won't work. Check out this proverb. A man of quick temper acts foolishly, and a man of evil devices is hated. If you're going to be angry and mad at people all the time, guess what? You're not going to get any respect at all. Maybe to your face. But you'll have no more authority. Have a bent towards forgiveness, kindness, and compassion. Here's the last one. Let's say you want to get a conflict resolved. And, and someone else is fuming, so you get fuming mad too, and you fight fire with fire, and you, you come in with a sledgehammer, and you just, want, you just want it to be resolved, so you yell back and forth, yell back and forth. That actually won't help. Have a bent towards kindness, forgiveness, and compassion, and know that a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. See, it's, it's counterintuitive, but it's true. Everything you think you're going to accomplish through being angry, through being mad, you'll You won't accomplish that, but you will through forgiveness, kindness, and compassion. And if you don't think this works, try it out. Okay, I did. Okay, check this story out. Okay, I, my, my laptop was broken. My, I, you know, it wasn't my fault. It was Windows 10's fault, okay? It wasn't my fault. Okay, they upgraded my software, and it didn't work. And the conventional wisdom is, if you want to get uh, your laptop fixed for free, in that situation, you call up customer service and you yell and scream until you get someone that will fix your problem for you, right? That's conventional wisdom. I committed not to do that. I committed to not do that. I was just going to be kind and lighthearted and polite and understanding and patient and very, very, very persistent. So I called up customer service with that kind of attitude. And I'm not going to lie, it took forever. It took a really, really, really long time. This took forever. But at the end of the day, I got my laptop completely fixed, free of charge. Uh, It would have cost me a bundle. It cost me nothing. And they upgraded a bunch of my uh, programs to the newest versions for free. Now, if I had called them up and just yelled at them all day, they would have had a reason just to hang up on me, right? But whatever I thought I could accomplish through malice, I actually accomplished through forgiveness. This has so many wonderful, beautiful, freeing applications. And here's one that, that really speaks to me. There are some people who, you know, they want to get over the hurt that their parents have left on them. And so what they do is they're bitter towards their parents. They're, they ignore them, they don't talk to them, they say bad things about them, because they want to get over the hurt that they did to them. But actually that won't work. Forgiveness, kindness, and compassion towards those people, it'll get you on the road to recovery. Whatever you think is going to work with malice actually works with forgiveness. It's a wonderful truth. I love it. I, I, I love it a lot. Okay. Now, excuse me. <laughs> okay, I'm getting over a cold. <laughs> okay. Okay. Hey, you know what's funny? That's funny. But you know what else is funny? Whenever we're, we're malicious towards someone and it doesn't seem to be having the desired effect, like, you know, we get angry at someone because we want things to get better, but they're not getting better. You know what we do? We don't, we don't turn the other way and be kind after that, right? No, we get more mad. We get more malicious. We get more bitter, right, if it doesn't work. 
And then it just becomes this spiral where you just get more angry and more upset and more mad. And it, this absolutely ruins relationships. Is anyone here in that spot? Don't raise your hand. But are you in that spot? You know, it's not working, so you just get more mad. No, try something new. Try kindness, compassion, and forgiveness. Now, here's another thing. Most, most people who get mad, they're not looking for reconciliation at all. Here's what they're looking for. They're looking for a revenge, right? They're thinking, hey, I want that person to feel as bad as they made me feel, so I'm going to be mad. Like, that's the reason why they're mad, because they want some revenge. Okay, here's a few notes on that. One, stop that, okay? Like, it's, it's almost like, you know, how dare anyone cross your path, right? No, you got to get over yourself. But here's the secret. If you really do want to get back at someone, kindness, compassion, and forgiveness will work a lot better. Check this out. I love this verse. Take, take a look at this. If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he is thirsty, give him water to drink. Why? For you will heap burning coals on his head. And the Lord will reward you. You kidding me? That's way better, right? That's way better. Have a slant towards kindness, forgiveness, and compassion, and not revenge. Secondly, here's another thing. This one's more serious. If we believe in a God who is in complete control, right? He, he's all righteous. He's all good. He's, he's perfect, and he's in complete control. Then we allow him, we trust him to be just. He's just. He's completely just. Now, when we act in a way that makes it show as though we don't trust God to administer justice, that is unbelief, right? We don't believe that God is going to take care of it like he said he would. That's unbelief. When we say to God, hey, God, you're not going to take care of this, so I'm just going to go ahead and get revenge on this person myself, that is unbelief. It's the definition. We don't, we don't want to go there. So have a bent towards kindness, compassion, and forgiveness, and it's going to work so, so much better. Again, Everything that you think that is, is going to work through malicious, isn't a malice, it's not going to work. And this is important for, the, for our church because we do. We have people in this church, uh, also outside the church, but in this church, who, are, are, who think they are accomplishing something by being bitter and stubborn. Really. It could be over an insult that happened in the church. It could be over money. It could be over a decision the church made 30 years ago, or 10 years ago, or 5 years ago, or, or this year, or the direction the church is going, I, I really don't know. But there are people uh, that think they're accomplishing something by being bitter about those things for, for long, long periods of time. And I, and I want to say, it doesn't matter if you're in the right or in the wrong, but being bitter about those things will get you nowhere real fast. A lifetime of bitterness towards something won't have nearly the effect of 10 minutes of kindness, compassion, and forgiveness. Isn't that way better? So don't waste your life. Don't waste your life being bitter. It's not going to work, and we're missing out on being kind, compassionate, and forgiveness. And the interesting thing is, even, even when we believe that, even when we know that a grudge does nothing, it's so hard for us to actually forgive someone. Like, have you ever been there? You, you're in the room with someone. You need to forgive. You need to have that conversation. You're in the same room, and you're looking at them, and you're like, oh, I need to talk to that person. And you just can't do it. It happens, happens to me. I don't know. It happened to you. It happens to me. we got to swallow our pride. And at, at, in points like that, we have to look to Christ. And we have to say, we have to, we have to consider God who became man and died a death, even a death on a cross, for our sake. But I mean, here's the wonderful thing about, about that. When Jesus obeyed his heavenly father by humbling himself, it was actually for Christ's greatest joy and greatest good. Because right now, he is eternally clothed in splendor at the right hand of the father. His humbling himself was for his best. And you know what? That same thing is true for you and for me. Obedience to the Father, obedience to God. Yes, that is to glorify God, absolutely. But you know what else? It's also for our best, our fullest joy. Here's the mind shift that I want to happen in, in, in 
Everyone. Everyone. I want everyone to have this kind of mind shift in your life. Uh, here's the thing. The life you're looking for in rebellion to God, the life that you're seeking after in rebellion to God can only be found through obedience to God. There are people who, who want riches. They just want riches. They want to they be wealthy. And so they go and, and they do all that they sinfully can to make sure that that happens, whether it is be greedy or steal or do whatever it is to be wealthy. But you know what? Those riches are not true riches. They're going to go away. They are temporary. They are just a mirage. If you want, if you want riches, rebellion to God is not going to get you them. And I'm talking about real riches, like the kind of riches that God wants to give his children. If you want those kind of riches, you have to live a life in obedience to God. Let's say you want a life of joy. You want to be happy. You want to, you want to experience things and, and have, and have full-on joy. So you do whatever you can, whatever you can, sinful or not, to have as much joy as you want in your life and, and go through all the worldly pleasures that there are that you can get. But you know what? Those things are going to leave you empty and flat every single time. If you want joy, find your inexhaustible source of joy in Christ. I, I, I love this. The next few truths are like some of my favorite. So here we go. Okay. We often think that we are doing God a great favor when we obey him. Like we're doing him a big favor. Like he really needs our, forg- our obedience. We really need to do that right? But God gave us his word for us. Take a look at this. When you obey, you aren't doing God a favor. You're doing yourself a favor. God doesn't want your stale obedience. He doesn't want you to obey and glorify him because you have to, because you need to, because you won't get into heaven otherwise, because you're scared of him, because your parents did. He doesn't want any of that. He wants you to forget. He wants you to obey so that you can grab hold of the kind of life that he wants for you and all of its blessings and all of its joys. And when we experience that and we love that and we're, we're so thankful to God because he's so good and that glorifies him. Isn't that so much better than glorifying him out of slavish duty? We can, we can glorify him because he wants what's best for us. That's so good. Now here's... Some of you might be thinking right now, gears are turning, and you're thinking, man, Tyler, you're sounding an awful lot like a prosperity gospel preacher up there today. You know, prosperity gospel means you believe the gospel, you follow Jesus, and Jesus will give you the desires of your heart, whether that's money or houses or cars or whatever. He'll just bless you. So are you saying, Tyler, that if I obey God, he's going to bless me? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. But here's the thing. I don't believe the prosperity gospel. Here's why. I don't believe it. Here's why. It's not good enough. Prosperity gospel is not good enough. Here's where it fails. The prosperity gospel says you can have the life you've always wanted. But the true gospel says you can have the life that God's always wanted for you. And that's infinitely better. You kidding me? You can't design a life for yourself that is even close to as good as the life that God has in store for you. You can't even, if you had a magic piece of paper and you could write down all the details of your life and they all came true, first of all, you'd make a wreck of your life for sure if you did that. But second, even if you didn't make a wreck of your life, whatever that was does not even come close to what God wants to give his children. That's true prosperity. Prosperity is when we grab hold of God's word for our lives so we can experience what God wants for our lives so that we can have life and life to the full, glorify God, but also have our fullest joy. That is so good. Are you kidding me? Like, it's too good to be true, but it is true. The greatest exchange, the greatest exchange that God has ever arranged is that we put off our old self, which was just robbing us of joy and just putting us down. We put that off, and we put on the new self, which unleashes the kind of life that God wants for his children. And when we do that, when we make that exchange, not only do we glorify God, but get this, 
we get eternal life. What kind of deal is that? God is so good. We don't have to pursue God slavishly because we have to. We pursue him to glorify him and to fulfill our greatest joy. I want to close with a passage of scripture. And growing up, I never understood this passage, never got it. I always was like, this guy's, I was always like, this guy, whoever wrote this, was making it up. He's just being a, you know, he's just being a Sunday school kid with all the right answers. But take a look at this. Take a look at these verses. I never understood this. Deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. Wondrous things out of your law? Okay. I'm a sojourner on the earth. Hide not your commandments from me. My soul is consumed with longing for your rules at all times. What? Consumed with longing for rules? What? Keep going. You rebuke the insolent, accursed ones who wander from your commandments. Take away from me scorn and contempt, for I have kept your testimonies. Even though princes sit plotting against me, your servant will meditate on your statutes. Your testimonies are my delight. They are my counselors. What? Never understood this. Who can say that? Who can love God's rules and commandments so much? Only those who understand, who believe, who hold to the fact that what God wants for us, his word to us, is for his glory, yes, but also for our fullest joy. And if you believe that and if you hold to that, you're going to unlock the pure delight and joy of knowing Christ. Hey, Lord, you're so good to us. You're amazing. You're, you're incredible. And, and Lord, we just love you. And we're thankful for all that you've done for us, all that you continue to do for us. Lord, help us to put off the old self. Help us to put off malice and rage. We've got bitterness in our lives. We need to get rid of that because uh, it's not doing us any good. And it's not doing uh, you any glory either. So, Lord, help us to overcome our old self by your spirit that you may give us exactly what you want for us, a life that is eternally delighting in you. Lord, give us that. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. It is our desire to encourage you through this program. If you do not yet belong to a church, we'd love to have you come and connect with us. We have programs for all ages. There is a spiritual need, or if you have been blessed through our service, we'd love to hear from you. You can contact us during regular office hours by phone, or you can email us. Thank you for watching our service. May God bless you.